Hello and welcome to the first of three lectures on 18th century European theater. This is lecture 12a, part one, Italy. Let's do a little bit of historical context. Um, Italy has been an occupied country since the 1550s. So most of the city-states of the Renaissance have been conquered by the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it was fiercely fought over by both the Protestants and the Catholics as part of the wars of Spanish succession at the beginning of the 18th century. So an occupied land, um, all the wealth and all the uh, artistry of the um, Renaissance is now owned by those crafty Habsburgs. Eventually, most of the territory is controlled by Austria and by the Holy Roman Empire. So you can see here, this is the German states, the Holy Roman Empire, and they just kind of came in here and kind of took over the city states. Austria got a few. Austria is right here. So they snuck in over the border, got some of the northern territories, and the uh, Holy Roman Empire decided they're going to take the rest of it. So there. So we don't see as much of the Enlightenment as we saw in other parts of Europe. There's no great social philosophers, no scientific breakthroughs. They make their living mostly because of a thriving middle class and because of a booming tourist business. So uh, all the other European states, England as well, um, are uh, admired in the Enlightenment. So they all trek to Italy to see the ruins and geek and gawk over the Greco-Roman um, ruins, as you see here in this engraving by Piranesi, who we'll talk about a little later. They were still a dominant force in art. Um, they were at the forefront of the Baroque movement in art and architecture. Um, just to refresh your memory, Baroque art is characterized by a break from the symmetry of neoclassicism. It is very curvilinear. Uh, in art, the tension of movement is characterized by chiaroscuro, which is dramatic contrast in light and shadow. As you can see in this picture of the young beggar by Bartolo Murillo, Murillo, I guess, excuse me. You can see the very strong light source coming in here hitting the beggar, the young boy, and then this hugely contrasting dark background. So this is a big movement in Baroque art in the 18th century, which started in Italy. Here's some Baroque architecture, as you can see, very curvilinear, very organic. Um, we have new materials such as plaster and stucco, which allow artists to have free reign to create these, these very elegant, um, very humanistic, I could say, very very curvilinear, I've said that so many times already, and organic forms. So texture is also very important. Fabric, attention to detail. You can see the folds in the fabric, the, the feathers on the wing are given great detail thanks to the use of plaster and stucco, which allow this art form to flourish. Just as an aside, we start to see in the mid-century the Rococo style, which is just a more precious version, a little more subdued, um, smaller scale, as you can see here in this altarpiece. <clears throat> Excuse me, close up might have served it better. You can see this altarpiece is very precise. So instead of having the big giant curvilinear Baroque, they're much smaller. Also, we should mention uh, perspective drawing, which is a big biggie, which it still is to this day. Um, in art classes and in architecture classes, students are sometimes forced to do perspective drawing. Um, and these are uh, techniques that were learned uh, back in the 18th century and the 17th century, which keep going on forever. Okay. Now, these are good advances in art in Italy spread throughout Europe. However, the most popular form of export was opera. So why don't we talk about opera for a little bit? Um, <clears throat> it, was, you know, it was developed in the 17th century, as you may remember. And by the 1700s, there was a firm hold of Italian opera on the rest of Europe. And they had sort of developed this style of opera. opera. Um, originally, they were these extravagant, confusing works based on mythology, uh, loosely connected plots, lots of artifice, lots of deix machina, and just, just a big old mess, just an excuse to sing some songs. And then we have composers at the beginning of the 18th century, like Alessandro Scarlatti, and librettists such as Metastasio, who make, take these operas and make them more personal, make them more coherent, gave them plots. So this was a new thing. This is what came to be known as the Neapolitan School, which advocated a strong libretto, 
with pleasing Baroque melodies. So, by the 1700s, we have the basic form established, which stays pretty much through the next three, four hundred years, which means to now. Three movement overture, <clears throat> followed by three acts, consisting of sharply differenti differentiated recitatives and arias with an occasional duet or ensemble piece with a final coro, a big number for the entire cast. The plot of the libretto was linear, consisting of conflicts and misunderstandings. Everything resolved in, a, resolved in a happy ending, usually through the intervention of a benevolent despot, something we're not used to in more modern operas. They tend to be more tragic. Now, the libretto was greater importance than the score. In fact, many operas were made up of music from more than one composer, built around the libretto. So it's sort of like a modern bit musical. You may take a libretto, a story, and then build songs around it. Uh, kind of jukebox musical-esque. But the main task, not the plot or libretto, it was to serve the performer, the singer. The singer was key in, um, in Italian opera of this time, and all elements were subservient to that. So it wasn't uncommon to rewrite parts of an op opera to accommodate a singer's ability. Now, there are two types of singers who are in the highest demand at this time. The soprano, of course, who is always in the highest demand, no matter what era it is and this unique Italian development known as castrato, or castrati, for plural. And they toured throughout Europe to great acclaim. If you're not familiar with the term, castrati um, are young men, prepubescent boys, who are castrated. And the idea is that once they're castrated before puberty, they will retain this high-pitched voice and achieve high notes unobtainable by usually male singers. Um, did it work on everybody? Not really, uh, but some it did. Uh, some became great stars, like the great Fadinelli, who was the greatest of all castrati, very popular in London and Paris in the 20s and 30s. So it lasted for, this lasted about 50, 60 years, um, but it started to fade in the latter part of the century. And by the beginning of the 19th century, audience members, patrons started to realize like, maybe this is a cruel thing. So it was banned, and those few remaining singers, poor people at the end, were seen as freaks of nature, even though it wasn't really their fault. So let's talk a bit about conventional Italian opera. It is known as opera seria, um, which is a more obviously serious opera. It is being challenged in popularity by the more intimate form of comic opera known as opera buffa by the mid-century, usually set in rustic or dramatic settings, often adapted from Shakespeare as many operas through the 18th and 19th and 20th century are Shakespeare adaptations. Very similar to English ballad opera. Uh, one of the most notable composers of this genre was Leonardo Vinci, and then also Giovanni Pergolesi. Another innovation to note that opera had on the theater world, of course, was the architecture of the public opera house. Um, it was the opera houses of the previous century which developed proscenium arches and wing and shutter scenery. This was carried even further with the creation of even deeper stages equipped with pole and chariot systems. Houses were similar to uh, straight play, regular houses with a pit box gallery set up, but then one development started to kind of creep in, and this was the horseshoe-shaped auditorium, as you can see in this overhead view in a typical Italian opera house. Uh, two reasons. One, better to aid sight with, with sight lines from boxes at the back of the house. And two, it is better for the acoustics. Furthermore, opera houses throughout Europe begin to develop, designate royal boxes at the back of the house in the gallery. So up high in the middle of the back where you see royalty and aristocracy. Also, because we have the rise of a prosperous middle class in later curtain times, uh, this is becoming more and more of a social event. So we start to see uh, increases in customer comfort. Enclosed porticos at the entrance, as you can see right here, so you can pull your carriage up to a covered entrance so you don't get rain on your lovely gown or tuxedo. Uh, luxurious salons, upholstered chairs instead of backless benches in the pit. So very more upscale. <laughs> Now, the most important centers for opera, Italian opera at this time, were Venice, Milan, and interestingly enough, Vienna, Austria, which has a, um, a reputation, has a history of music. 
It is also the center of the powerful Habsburg dynasty. Remember, those are the rural rulers of, of Italy right now. And it had the wealth and the prestige needed to lure the best, lure the best composers, librettists, singers, and designers away from Italy. So this is also where we get the first reactions against Italian opera. You start to see towards the middle and end of the century with compositions by Gluck and, of course, Gluck and of course Mozart. We should talk about one of the greatest opera houses of all time, the Teatro alla Scala, better known as La Scala in Milan, <clears throat> commissioned by wealthy patrons who demanded comfort and luxurious accommodations. It is one of the largest stages in the world, 53 feet deep, 67 feet wide, 85 feet high. The stage itself is almost a freaking office park. 3,000 seats lit by 84 oil chandeliers. It is considered not only one of the most the finest opera houses in the world, but one of the finest theaters in the world. Here's a photo of it uh, from the early 20th century, just to see, get an idea of the massiveness of the house there. You can see the 3,000 people packed in, ready to see a great opera. Right now, we're, uh, Richard Strauss's Salome is playing there this week. So go and enjoy. I'm going to talk a moment about serious Italian drama in this period. It is almost non-existent. Like I said, opera is king, so most professional writers are writing librettos. Uh, we can estimate there's about 20,000 librettos written in the 17th and 18th century. That's a lot. Really not a lot of interest in spoken drama in Italy. Meh, I don't know. Uh, the only tragedy of note before 1750 was Merope by De Maffi, who... Um, was disenchanted by the sad state of Italian theater and sought to reinvigorate with plays based on neoclassical models. It was a big hit, and it did inspire Italy's next great tragic playwright, who we should mention here, Count Vittorio Alfieri. Alfieri came to the fore around the 1770s, in the latter part of the century. So he wrote tragedies based on strong emotions, told in the simplest story possible, very much influenced by Jean Racine. Uh, he was a proponent for Italian independence, as any good Italian would be, and most of his work contained a strong political doctrine. His masterpiece was Saul, based on the biblical story of King Saul and his conflict with King David. Very good example of an Alfieri tragedy. So, for instance, King Saul is driven mad with jealousy over the success of his young virile rival, David. Over the course of the play, Saul wrestles with his madness, but in the end he succumbs to ruination and death. It is known for strong characterizations, brilliant poetry, and unfortunately, after Alfieri, that's pretty much it. The rest of those playwrights say, we're going to go where the money is, we're going to go write some libretto. So we will not see serious Italian drama until the 20th century with Luigi Pinandello. So bye, drama. Been nice knowing you. Comedy did much, much better in the form of Commedia dell'arte. But here, the problem is, this is the 18th century, so they've been playing this stuff for 200 years. So, okay, we've seen it, we've seen it. So some spectacle was added, some extra characters. Um, also, you know, just, it seems crude and unfeeling now. We have families, we have a prosperous middle class. They like the sentimental comedies from England and from France. And this is, it's just stupid. Enter Carlos Goldoni in the 1740s. He is a writer of Commedia scenarios. He is also a prolific playwright, wrote 10 tragedies, 83 musical dramas, and about 150 comedies. He wrote a series of essays championing a new form of Commedia dell'arte, which set off a very spirited debate over the future of uh, the genre. And that would end up making Venice the center of Italian theater. So he said, you know what? These are crude improvisations, and they are silly and dated, and we need a more scripted, more sentimental comedy. He was known for portraying the middle and lower classes in the positive light and denigrating the nobility whom he saw as decadent and useless. And he also tended to idealize women characters. For example, in one of his most famous works, The Mistress of the Inn, Mirandolina is ruled by three nobles, each representing a trait of nobility that Goldoni found repugnant. In the end, she rejects them all in favor of her loyal, resourceful servant, Fabrizio. 
perhaps his, well, not perhaps, his best known work and one that has endured to modern time is The Servant of Two Masters, which has only one improvised part, the Zani Truffaldino. The Servant of Two Masters was written at the request of comedian actor Antonio Sacco. Obstensively, the plot revolves around mistaken, uh, familiar themes of mistaken identity, star-crossed lovers, so forth, but the real focus is on Truffaldino, the servant. Servant to Beatrice, the female ingenue, he always complains about his belly being empty. He finds a way to get an extra dinner by secretly agreeing to become the servant to Florindo. Beatrice is a strange lover who is staying at the same hotel. And like many uh, comedies uh, that, uh, are involved, that involve star-crossed lovers and mistaken identities, this too is based on Plautus' The Menachme, that classic Roman comedy. The action of the play mainly consists of Truffaldino serving both lovers without them finding out about each other, or Truffaldino's duplicity, while always trying to find something to eat. Perhaps the most famous scene is the Lazzi of the Waiter, where Truffaldino is serving a banquet to both masters at the same time without each knowing about the other, and at the same time, stealing food for himself. In 1848, Galdoni joined the Commedia Company of Girolamo Medebac, where he began instituting these reforms. And in the 50, 1750, he proposed even more radical changes. For instance, he advocated abandoning masks and relying on facial expressions never before heard of, adapting better stage speech, abandoning the con conventional situations of comedian favor of subjects based on real life. So a very radical change. Also, he, uh, he um, advocated eliminating the crude, vulgar language and stage business of comedia, getting rid of some of the stock characters, softening others, Pantaloni, for example, was a lecherous old man in traditional commedia. Here he is an honest merchant and a good father. Now, the good thing is, while they, these reforms were maybe not so uh, popular with the old school commedia performers, were very popular with the audience. So, and gained him uh, quite a bit of fame. In 1762, he was invited to Paris to write for the Comédie Italienne. He had a rival, a nobleman turned writer, Carlo Gazzi. Gazzi didn't like Goldoni, mostly because he thought Goldoni was disrespectful of his class, the upper class and the aristocracy. So he strongly objected to the, uh, reforms of sentimentality, although he too didn't want to go back to old school comedia because it was crude and vulgar. He did emphasize the fantasy, enchantment and improvisation of mass characters. <clears throat> he wrote 10 plays, which he called Fiabe. Between 1761 and 1765, they were based on Asian myths and Western fairy tales. They're a mixture of planned action and improvisation, satirizing sentimentality and banality. He sought to emphasize fantastical theatrical elements and consciously avoided any reference to contemporary or realistic situations. They were popular in time and for a time in Italy, but they made more of an impact in France and Germany. And 19th century writers, uh, particularly the German Romantics, were very much inspired by them, as were the non-realists of the early 20th century. His play Turn Dot in 1762 was the basis for Puccini's famed opera. Uh, a charming piece, The Love for Three Arms, was also used by Prokofiev, excuse me, and of course, King Stag is still played to this day. So a little bit about uh, the King Stag. The play is about Doramo, king of the Oriental Kingdom of Serendipo, who is searching for a wife. With the aid of a magical statue, he has already interviewed and rejected 748 candidates, a little bit picky there, before meeting Angela, the beautiful daughter of his second minister. She alone loves him not for his crown, but for himself. Unfortunately, she is also loved by the evil Tartaglia, prime minister of Serendipo, who is determined that the king shall marry his daughter, Clarice. Soon Tartaglia has hatched a terrible plan. He discovers that Doramo knows a magic spell with which he can transfer his soul into the body of a dead creature. With the king and his court, when the king and his court are out hunting in the enchanted forest of Miracoli, Tartaglia seizes his moment and challenges Doramo to demonstrate his magical powers by sending his soul into the corpse of a stag they have just killed. The king does so, whereupon Tartaglia, repeating the spell, implants his own spirit in the dead body of the king. Uh-oh. 
Mayhem ensues, and for a time, all scenes lost for Doramo and Angela. But this is a fairy tale, and as in all the best fairy tales, everything ends happily ever after. So this is a very good indication of the sort of work um, that Gatsi is doing. Eventually, his popularity was overshadowed by sentimental comedies, um, so he took to writing Spanish cape and sword plays, but they weren't as successful as his Tin Fiabe. And this is pretty much it. Um, most of the drama, le what's left in Italy, is um, European, French, and German plays, and English. Okay, then. Here's a quick synopsis of The Love for Three Oranges, which uh, shows you also another kind of characteristic of Fiabe. I'm going to read this really fast, so we'll get through it. The king is worried about his, because his son, the prince, is ill and depressed, suffering from hypochondria. He summons his jester, Truffaldino, to arrange a series of entertainments in an attempt to make his son laugh. But Leandra, the prime minister, is scornful of the plan. In fact, he is plotting with the king's niece, Princess Clarissa, to kill the prince, so she will be next in line to the throne. The entertainments fail to make the prince laugh because Leander's protector, Fata Morgana, is present, but when the crowd knocks Fata Morgana down, the prince finally begins to laugh. She is, so, she is so incensed that she casts a curse on him that he will fall in love with three oranges. What a strange curse. With Truffledino, he rushes off to Cook's kitchen where the oranges are. To Chilio, the king's protector, gives Truffledino an enchanted ribbon to protect them from the cook and warns them not to, warns them not to open the oranges until they are near water. When he and the prince arrive at the cook's kitchen, he distracts the cook by giving her the ribbon, and the prince takes the three oranges. As they cross the desert, uh, the oranges grow in size, and tired of dragging them along, the prince insists on having a sleep. While he is sleeping, Tuffledino becomes thirsty and decides to open one of the oranges, but is, is surprised to find a princess inside. She says she'll die soon unless he gives her water, so in desperation he opens the second orange. It contains a second prince who also needs water, and the prince awakes to see the two princesses, both having died of thirst. Well, that's great. The prince opens the last orange, and with help from the onlookers who give him a bottle of water, he saves the third princess and pledges to marry her. After a final attempt to thwart him by Feta Morgana, the prince and princess are married to the joy of the king and his courtiers. And curtain. Let's move on to uh, Italian theater's most enduring legacy after opera, and that is its contribution to scene design. So, to review, by 1700, the symmetrical wing and shutter style, um, when chariot and pole um, have spread throughout Europe. Torelli, who created chariot and pole system, is near legendary. And except for in England, his system has been widely applied. Since the mid-16th century, designers from Italy have created the most technically advanced and lavish productions available. Some examples. In 1668, Ludovico and Giovanni Bernassini staged an opera that required 30, 23 sets, 35 machines, and a final scene that had three groups of dancers performing simultaneously, one each for land, sea, and sky. Because why not? Here you see an engraving of the golden apple, which uh, has incorporated such spectacle. However, um, no matter how massive scenery got, there's still that issue of adhering to the same for formula of wing and drop scenery and vanishing point vistas. So again, looking at this engraving, they all pretty much look the same. They got, you know, big, large columns, you know, uh, uh, machines coming down, pulleys with characters on clouds and so forth, and an elaborate drop system in the back. But they all still have that same formula. Enter the remarkable Bibiana family. So from 1690 to 1787, there are seven family members spanning three generations who will radicalize scene design. The founder is Giovanni Maria Galli da Bibiana, and this, he was an artist who painted altarpieces. His son was Ferdinando Galli Bibiana, the most renowned of the group, celebrated throughout Europe for his architectural views and theatrical designs. We got more. Francesco Galli Bibiana, brother of Ferdinando, celebrated chiefly as designer of great European theaters. Other members include Alessandro Galli Bibiana, son of Ferdinando, a fresco painter and architect, Giuseppe Galli Bibiana, second son and pupil of Ferdinando, and like him, renowned for his sumptuous decorations designed principally for the courts and theater of Vienna, Munich, Dresden, Bayreuth, and Prague. Oh, let's not forget Antonio Galli Bibiana, third son of Ferdinando, architect, designer, and finally, 
Carl Logali Bibiana, the son of Giuseppe, a painter and architect employed at many of the European courts. So this is the remarkable Bibiana family. Why are they so important? Well, three big, big major innovations. First, they embraced Baroque decoration. Their sets were a departure from symmetrical rings of the Renaissance. They, they used curvilineal, asymmetrical, extravagant designs, curvilinear elements. Uh, also, Ferdinando introduced uh, angle perspective, scana per angolo, using two or more vanishing points to the side, opening up the center stage. You can kind of see here, and we'll see in other engravings. Yes, here's a good one. You can see these pieces. Let's see here kind of going off in two dimensions instead of one straight in the middle. So they just kind of tra uh, trail off into the wings, leaving the center open. So, which I'll try, whoops, there we go, <laughs> like that. Uh, also, the scale of scenery was altered. Before, the stage was treated as an extension of the auditorium, and scenery was scaled proportionally. So if you had a high uh, top of your proscenium arch, the buildings would come under that. They could be high, but they were they were part of that world. So what the BBM is is divorce the scenery from the auditorium. With the two-point perspective, it was possible to create vistas going off into unseen horizons. Walls could appear to rise up to vast heights above the proscenium arch. As seen here, you can see that this one on the left, I'm going to mark this up even more, this one on the left here, is going up into the wings and this is just going off stage so no longer is it oh this is what's on the stage it's complete it's there's another world out there beyond the walls also a designer we must um, uh, mention is uh, Paolo Landriani who worked at La Scala Landriani's specialty was domestic settings for opera buffa to resent to represent the intimate confines of private homes that were settings of many of these operas, he angled the wing flats as credit for popularizing the box set. So he was the one who uh, perfected it, used it on a regular basis, and helped pave the way for its widespread use in the 19th century. What is a box set, you may be asking? Good question. Uh, it's a departure from the wing and drop system that has been so prevalent for 300 years. It is consisted of three solid walls with the proscenium arch serving as an invisible fourth wall. Unlike perspective, there are no gaps between the wall. Um, they are meant to represent real rooms, real places with furniture, uh, and not the fanciful three um, courts and perspective of uh, earlier opera sets. Another interesting uh, influence on the look of scenery came with the discovery of Herculaneum in 1709 and Pompeii in 1748. So these were the cities that were, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, covered, um, engulfed by the lava of Mount Vesuvius, and they were uh, found almost perfectly intact. So it started this growing interest in ruins. So you start to see more and more of these classical structures in various states of deterioration, you know, crumbling um, crumbling stone, vines, and shrubs everywhere. So uh, this is an engraving by Piranesi, Roman bath ruins. So you can see they were, this uh, in, um, contributed to Italy's tourism uh, craze because people just flocked from everywhere to see these wonderful ruins of Greek, and well, not Greek, but of Roman, um, Roman Empire uh, structures. Okay. Uh, another influence on decoration was chinoserie, which is a term for Fencer's decorous Western interpretation of Chinese and Middle Eastern art. Finally, also, um, probably the most important influence was the introduction of mood into uh, the design. So before 18th century, scenery was painted with every detail clearly visible. And then along came Giovanni Battista Piranesi, artist and engraver. He wasn't a scene designer. He was, a, he was an artist. He was a fine artist, and he did lots of engravings of ancient ruins, antiquities, and hypothetical prison scenes. Um, we see one here, you, you've seen in this lecture, there's been a lot of Piranesi engravings. So you can see that use of um, asymmetrical perspective. He emphasized chiaroscuro there, that gives that atmosphere. So very strong contrast between light and dark. So after that, designers would use shadow to suggest scale and mood. 
So they depicted places bathed in moonlight, interior spaces illuminated by a few shafts of light. Not as much color, sepia tones, washes of green, yellow, and lavender. So that too is a departure from previous designs. Uh, here are some links for the left, uh, lecture. This lecture, Music from Prokofiev's Love for Three Oranges, a rousing uh, introduction. Uh, interesting, I found a clip of Alessandro Marecci, who was the last castrati singing Ave Maria, which is both beautiful and disturbing at the same time, and a tra uh, trailer of a production of The Servant of Two Masters from 2016. Thank you for listening. That is the end of Lecture 12A on 18th Century Italy.